My name is Michael Cohen. I'm a professor of international affairs at the New School University. My lecture will be about the urban economy in the new millennium. I'm interested in the question, why have we, the urbanists, been spending so much time focusing on housing and infrastructure and not thinking about the city as a place where we generate jobs and incomes and indeed create the basis of urban life itself. The world has become more urban and as we, as we learn about that, we have to understand much more about the possibilities of generating jobs and incomes as a part of, of how the, the city in fact develops and supports global development and national development. So I will be speaking about agglomeration economies, why is the city the center of economic activities. I'll be talking about some of the, the benefits and some of the costs of that process and some of the negative impacts. What is, how has this happened? I will also talk about why it matters today and in fact why, what are some of the, the real challenges that we face when we think about the, the question of the urban economy. We know that the world has become more urban since 2008, the world is more than half urban. And we know also that in that context, more and more people have come to cities, and we know that more and more people within cities, our population growth is expanding, and so we're looking toward 2 billion more people over the next, next 20 years or so. The question that I'm really interested in is how, in fact, can we make the city more productive? How, do, how can we avoid the, the phenomena of the city at the one, on one hand being the locus of promise, of opportunity, but also the locus and the site of, of the urbanization of poverty. And I think it's true that within the, within the cities, um, the reason that people are able to generate more income and, aid, and generate more, more, more jobs and economic opportunities are in fact because we're close together. What the economists refer to as agglomeration economies and localization economies, that is where people are closer together and, and in, in dense areas people are able to do more together. The, the localization economies reflect the fact that when more people are together, when there's more density, it's easier to do business, it's easier to produce things and in many places uh, we see industries where people, for example in New York City, uh, we have the, the famous example of the garment district where on, on one floor in, in building people are producing buttons and downstairs they're producing zippers and across the street they're assembling them with, with cloth. There, there are advantages of being together and producing goods and services and those, those localization economies make a tremendous amount of difference. They allow people to be more productive. They allow them to move faster, produce more, and produce at a higher quality. And the result is that, that in places of great density, as we see in, in East Asia, for example, in China or Hong Kong or some other places like Bangkok, those economies of agglomeration and density are reflected in economies of scale. You can produce more, and when you can produce more, you can generate more incomes. We know also that there are many cities where, where we have more than one or two or three or dozens, in fact, of industries that are close together and are allowing this kind of growth. And so this allows an exchange of ideas, improved technology, and what the, also what the economists refer to as knowledge spillovers, where learning from one industry can, can help generate productivity in the other. We, ha we have examples of industrial parks, of Silicon Valleys, of, of many places in different, in different cities where this proximity allows, allows more productivity. So what does this mean at, at, at a larger level, but getting beyond just the city? What we really know now is that the cities determine the economic future of countries. We know that 80% that of the global GDP is coming from urban-based economic activities. 80%. 600 cities are generating more than 60% of global GDP. So it's not an exaggeration to say that in fact what happens in cities, whether cities are productive, will actually determine the economic, social, and political futures of our countries, indeed of the world. So the city is the space of opportunity, the opportunity for growth, and the promise for, for possibly a better future. At the same time, we know that when we put all these people together, they face the problems of congestion, of, extra, of what the economists call negative externalities, with, with, with more pollution, with more crime, with all kinds of disturbances, and use of infrastructure. And so these, these effects also are negative. We see more pollution, 
And as, in, as you see in this image of, of uh, a river in the south of Buenos Aires, it's one of the most polluted sites in the world, reflecting lots of people in, in limited amounts of, of, of space. We also know that sometimes if we have too many people in the city, the, the price of labor actually goes down. There's a surplus of labor. There's a lot of unemployment. And so one of the questions is, how do you keep productivity high, but also wages high? And how are you able to create opportunities for, for people to find living wages and live in, in a context of, of decent work? This has become much more complicated as big firms have come to dominate a lot of global production and what's known as global value chains are dominating the way in which a lot of this urban GDP is in fact generated around the world. Part of the challenge is how do we overcome, how do we make the city more productive? If the city is the engine of growth, why is it that there are so many poor people? Why is it there's so much inequality? And so one of the questions really is, what are the constraints to growth, the constraints to being productive? And what we see in many cities is that if we could improve the infrastructure, if we could improve infrastructure in places like Lagos, or Kinshasa, or Nairobi, or Bangkok, or Jakarta, or indeed in Chicago, and Atlanta, and New York, in all of these places, what we would find is that people would be able to continue to work and generate, generate uh, better incomes and, and better product, goods and services. So some of these deficits include the lack of electricity, the lack of water, lack of garbage collection, transportation, all of these things have absolute immediate effects on whether cities are productive and whether this allows the econ national economies to grow. We know that, for example, in New York City, uh, indeed, I live 20 blocks away from ground zero, that in that space at the moment of 9-11, it wasn't just that the towers were knocked down, it was that the urban economy came to a halt that infrastructure stopped working. We know that when the floods hit Mumbai in the monsoon, in the monsoon season, we know that the city stops and it's unable to, to function. So infrastructure is a, a critical part. We also know that, that the city is made up of what you might call dura durable assets. That is long-term physical contributions, buildings, pipes, streets, all kinds of physical aspects. And these durable assets need to be financed. They need to be not paid for by municipalities with the cash in their pockets, but they need to be financed over time with notions of mortgages and, and different kinds of, of financing instruments. And those simply don't exist in many of these cities. So one of the results of infrastructure deficiencies and less than productive economies is that we have increasing numbers of poor people who are unable to find jobs. So we have a paradox, and the paradox essentially is that, that people uh, come to the city, they seek a better life, and in many cases what we've really seen is the urbanization of poverty. We've seen more and more people living in cities with a, more, a, at least a billion people already in slums and two billion people coming and, and many of those will end up in slums. So the real challenge, it really is both for, po for poverty reduction and alleviation of, in of, of inequality, the real challenge is how do we generate those jobs and how do we get the, get the city growing? We also know that with income growth, we see inequality. We see some people gaining more than others. And we see differences. So the, the economic transformation of cities is what is also differentiation, making people different, different kinds of stratification in the city. And all of that generates uh, differences. And differences take the form of inequalities and injustice and segregation and all of these kinds of things really need to be part of this, part of this process, we need to be understood and addressed through, through policy. Now, why does this matter now? Why, why in, in uh, the first years of the new millennium have these issue, issues become so clear? One of the really interesting aspects of this problem has been with the global economic crisis since 2008. That crisis is felt mostly in cities. Most of the unemployment is in cities. And yet, when we look at what the G20, that is the richer countries of the world, and the leading countries of the world, are dominating the discussion, since 2009, they really have stopped talking about urban employment. They talk about maintaining demand, getting the economy going again. Going again. And so if you look at the stimulus packages that governments have adopted, from China to Chile to Brazil to Argentina to the United States, 
to, to many of the European countries, we see that the city is largely absent from the stimulus packages. And this is, I think, is disastrous because I think that, that what, we, what we're lacking is the fact that the stimulus that we need is in the cities to spark this urban economy. In the United States, Mr. Obama spent and the administration put lots of money into a stimulus package and it ended up going largely into rural areas and into infrastructure, not where the economic multipliers were, were available and therefore, as a result, this stimulus package has had much less effect than it should have. So the, the question is, how do you target aid in order to stimulate the economy to let it really grow? What we know from the global crisis of 2008, and this could continue, and it, indeed it continues in 2013 and beyond, is that reduced global credit in the financial sector, it reduces investment, it reduces consumption, it reduces employment. With, a, with, with lower demand, it means that economies actually shrink, and as smaller economies, mean that in fact there are fewer opportunities. Fewer opportunities means more poverty, it means a worse distribution of income. And so all of these questions about how, how global impacts and global changes affect the city and people in the city, this is really critical. And in the end, it reduces production. If you reduce, reduce production, you don't have tax revenues for public expenditures, for education, for health, for water supply, for transport, and you have a fiscal crisis. So in fact, the global crisis at the, at the global level generates what you might call adjustment at the urban level and fiscal crisis. And so these issues are all connected and in fact what we've seen since 2008 is that this pattern of causation really does happen. It affects cities all over the world and it's a very, very important, important part of the process. So we know that the first impacts of these crises come through trade, it comes through the demand for products, it comes through reduced jobs, and then in fact when we have fewer people working and fewer people able to, to earn incomes from their families, we get, we get less demand for other things. And so the economies contract. The world cannot afford, both rich and poor countries, cannot afford contracting economies. We need economies to grow. I think it's also very important to put this notion of our dependence on cities within this broader context of climate change. And in fact, we know that, that cities are feeling the climate change, that most of the populations live on the coast in most of these countries. And so the whole notion of sea level rise and the impact of climate change will have a direct, immediate effect on the urban economies, therefore on the economic futures and uh, political futures of countries. So urban flooding, as I mentioned before in the case of, of Mumbai, but we see this in very vividly uh, a couple of years ago in, in, in Bangkok with, with the flooding. We see it in, in Jakarta, in Manila, um, sometimes even in New York or Washington if a, if a water main breaks. So the, the flooding is a, is a serious problem. So part of the climate change issue has to be understood as not just a global threat, but a threat to the cities and therefore a threat to the economies and well-being and the global, global climate change will also affect people in a very, very direct way. That means we need to have cities which are spending, which are much more careful about how, how they're generating gases and, and greenhouse gases and how we think about energy. And that takes us right back to the question of production, it takes us back to the urban economy. What are we generating? What are the products we're generating? What are the processes? And we need to understand that in a very specific way. When I step back from all of this, my conclusion is that we, the urbanists, have largely entered the city through the house and the bathroom. We have not thought about the city as a space of economic, of, of economic growth, of production, of generation of jobs and income. And I think it's disastrous. I think the, this work reflects a bias. We've had not enough economists thinking about what I would call the productive side of the city. We talk about cities without slums. It sounds very good, but if you think about it, slums are probably a relative concept, and we're always going to have some, some cities where the housing is in less good shape than, than in other cities. But the idea that we would have cities without jobs is impossible. If we don't have jobs, we don't have cities. We don't have incomes. We don't have the possibility for, for, for life. So the productive side of the city needs more attention, and what I would say is that that's the real challenge for the urban millennium. Thank you.